All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's June 30th, 2021. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team while showing them the ropes. So if that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered, so feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to our YouTube channel. So if you enjoy the content and want to support it, please hit those like and subscribe buttons. Well, with that said, let's kick this off. Got a number of cool announcements for the week. Uh, the first announcement we want to bring to everyone's attention is Taylor uh, Dolzal, who joined us a couple weeks ago and talked about what it was life like being a HashiCorp uh, developer advocate. He's going to be doing a Waypoint demo uh, and showing us uh, the progress uh, that uh, has been made on that project, which is tremendous. Like uh, it's it's only like I don't know point. 040 or something, and uh, it's it's uh, capable of quite a lot. And I'm excited to get a demo of where it's at. Um, and the next thing is that we did release our firewall manager module. This was uh, not easy. The, there were a lot of challenges in provisioning the AWS firewall manager warts as a result of uh, the underlying, uh, at least Terraform resources, possibly AWS APIs. One of those warts I know we had to uh, make up uh, for was with a special environment variable or a special variable, or basically you need to toggle which uh, provider is used for destruction versus the provider used for creation. Uh, we haven't had to do that elsewhere. So if you're looking for WAF, um, it, it, AWS Firewall Manager with support for WAF2 and Kinesis, um, uh, Firehose for logging, uh, do check out this module uh, that we have released here. I think it I think it also required three upstream PRs to the Terraform provider to get it to work also that they merged in. Oh, oh yeah, three, three by yours truly, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we actually started this module like six months ago. Matt uh, ran into roadblocks, opened a bunch of PRs against the provider, and those eventually got merged. So we revisited it recently and got it working. So yeah, that was good. Uh, the other exciting thing is something uh, Matt is also working on as our resident uh, Terraform Go expert. Uh, we have now released, uh, well, it's almost in the registry, not yet. It will be in the next uh, couple of hours probably. Uh, the Terraform provider uh, that we have created for AWS Utils. And the use case here is very special. And I haven't seen anyone else yet doing this, but the challenge is when you're working with AWS and probably other clouds is that there are these things you wanna do that aren't supported by the Terraform provider. And there's a lot of things that you wanna do sometimes that will never be supported by the Terraform provider simply because it would be in bad taste. It would break conventions of Terraforms, uh, you know, the AWS providers um, uh, kind of promises of how it should work and manage the life cycle of resources. So we've been lately working on helping our clients achieve HIPAA compliance, SOC compliance, PCI compliance, CIS, all these things. And what you end up having to do is a lot of dirty work often with click ops, like how do you delete the default VPCs? Because by default, those are very insecure. And well, I guess you could technically import them into Terraform to manage them, but that's not any better than uh, you know coming up with some other script to delete them or something like that. So if you guys recall, uh, we started off this project called Turf, which isn't necessarily going away, but we're taking a, uh, a, a, a 
an updated approach to it. So turf was designed as our a cly an escape hatch to do these things we needed to do for compliance that we couldn't do out of the box using a AWS provider. Things like deleting all the default VPCs in an account. The reason why we do that for compliance is that, well, they aren't managed by Terraform, so we can't apply the security controls to them that we need to in order for them to uh, match the, the expectations uh, for the benchmarks uh, that we've enabled in Security Hub. So we need to delete them. Uh, and there's uh, you know, deploying Security Hub to an existing organization that is also not that straightforward to do in pure Terraform. Um, and when we had a bunch of stuff, but we still had to document how to use the CLI. And there was no state representing what we ran with the CLI. So how do we know what we've done and what we haven't done other than Security Hub telling us we should do something? So we wanted to streamline that. So we created uh, this new provider called Terraform, um, uh, well, Terraform provider, AWS Utils. So it, this is based on the official AWS provider, except for what we did was we kept the boilerplate, we removed every resource that the AWS provider has today, because our goal is not to replace it, our goal is to do what it can't do. And now we're adding in a lot of the capabilities that Turf had, so we can have a Terraform centric approach to achieving compliance um, on AWS. Um, so one of the first things that we're adding here is uh, deleting like the default VPCs. Now this is really odd, right? You have a Terraform uh, resource that when you create it, it destroys. That this is why it'll never be supported by the official AWS provider. But there's no real nice way of doing this otherwise. And honestly, look, we don't care about these default resources. They shouldn't even be there in the beginning. Why did Amazon even create this cruft for us? So, uh, Matt, uh, anything you'd like to add uh, about this uh, Terraform AWS utils provider you're working on? No, I think you covered it pretty well. The only thing I'll tell you is that uh, I fixed the bug that I had and published it, and it's ready to actually publish anytime now. So whenever you get oh, that. awesome, yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get to that immediately after uh, off this hours here. All what right. are some of the? Uh, if you guys don't mind me asking, what are yeah, the, some of the other uh, use cases you're that are in like the backlog to implement? Ah, oh, so yeah. many. I, I have Go a on. good one. So like yes. So Terraform gives you the ability to like set the organizational um, security hub account or the organizational guard duty account at, at you know at the AWS organization level, and that's that will work for all accounts that you create after you do that. But it doesn't go back and retroactively add all your existing accounts um, and designate the, that you know those guard duty or security hub accounts for that as an example. Um, so there's like, there's some just like silly things like that. Um, if you wanna disable a particular AWS um, control, like an AWS security hub control in a particular region, um, like for example, you only wanna look at IAM roles in one particular region. You don't wanna look at them in every single region because it's just, there's only one global instance of IAM for like an account. Um, there's no way to do that right now except for click ops or um, you know some other way. So these like role role disablement like resource is just something that they're never going to add like or rule disablement resource is something that they're never going to add to the default provider like the, the official provider because it's such a weird use case where you're disabling like something that exists that you turn on in a conformance pack. Um, but it's still something that you have to do. And to this point, we either had to script it or do a bunch of click ops to get it done. And the problem with both of those, as Eric alluded to, is that there's no state that lets you know that anyone ever did this. Um, so that's why we decided to go the provider route to, to do this. Because after using it for a couple of customers, it was like, hey, how do we know that you ran this command in the in the account and that it's currently in the right state that we expect it to be in. So that's why we went down the, the whole path there. A couple other examples to this. Um, so uh, Terraform is really intended to be used with uh, resources that have a life cycle that are created, updated, destroyed. 
but it's not really designed for like stateless operations. Um, so for example, what if you wanted to trigger an ECS run? Uh, it, that's not going to be uh, supported ever by Terraform because it doesn't fit into that pattern. And I get the reasons and I agree they shouldn't do it. But like if you're a power user and you know what you're doing and you're going to get around it anyways by using a local exec, well, let's just agree not to use local exec. Let's stick it into a provider and uh, do it in a little bit more bona fide way. Um, so that would be uh, another AWS use case. The other use case we've had, it's uh, problematic for us to this day, is that um, when you use AWS SSO, um, which uh, works with permission sets, and those permission sets result in IAM roles getting created, and those IAM roles uh, don't have deterministic names, well, trying to do more and more end-to-end -end automation uh, that we are constantly evolving to and trying to do uh, wasn't feasible. We, what we historically did was we actually did uh, that escape match with the data provider, uh, data exec provider and uh, running a um, add that to this provider as well, return all those dynamically generated IAM roles um, uh, so that we can associate it with the auth config map in EKS, for example. Hopefully EKS comes up with a better solution, but until then we have this uh, escape match. Matt, does that uh, give you a few good use cases? Help yeah, for sure. get the gears turning? Um, I'm interested to see some of the Golang code that does this, um, particularly that that assume role, uh, like the SSO one. Um, they sound like, uh, they'll be funny to see provider code that looks like that, but um, I'm, I'm, I totally get why you guys are doing it. It make a lot, makes lots of sense. Um, and I think it'll be a good thing for a catch all in the future. Yeah, and go on. No, I was just gonna say the weirdest code is the the one where on create we actually delete VPCs like that. That felt like really weird to, to write. I was like, I was like, I had to get my head around it. I'm like, wait, when I create, I'm deleting something, and then I have to check to see if that thing still exists. And then if it does exist, I have to pretend that like I removed, I have to remove the state so that it will automatically delete it again when create happens again. It was like very weird to wrap my head around it, but I think we have a bunch of those use case scenarios like that. So we'll, uh, we'll figure it out, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I also want to extend that uh, we did a little bit of Googling and didn't find any providers like this uh, for this use case. And I, I, I'm uh, you know, pretty confident that if you have a use case uh, that you'd like to implement, that we would probably uh, work with you on getting those into the provider. Because um, I, I really just want the place to put these things so we can stop doing local exec. And I, I don't like local exec because then you have to have all these other dependencies installed. Undoubtedly, somebody writes it then Ruby or Python, and you got to install all these modules and getting that to work cross platform is a pain in the butt. So that's why the provider route is superior to that uh, scripted approach. All right. Well, that's that's the provider in a nutshell. So check it out. Um, don't we'll post don't also it. don't forget to also encourage uh, anyone that has use cases that they want to implement themselves. We we'll gladly accept the PRs for those as well. So yeah, yeah. We so we my whole point those. with that was actually <laughs> yeah. we want you to do the PRs if you yeah. have those use cases, yeah. and, and uh, we'll work with you to get those merged. That's uh, that's what I meant to say. Um, all right. Uh, next, uh, next one. So this is an announcement by AWS, um, uh, comes, um, uh, well received. We worked on a DR project, um, over a year ago now. And one of the frustrating things was that, you know, we, we would use KMS to encrypt something in one region and, but we could never decrypt it in the other region. So we had to come up with other hoops to jump through in order for that to work. Uh, one case is like, well, what if you're using HashiCorp Vault um, in uh, your primary region and it's using an S3 backend that you're replicating encrypted to your uh, DR region? How do you uh, recover that? How do you uh, bring it back online? And it, there were complicated ways with, I believe, uh, replicated HMS or something, but we didn't go about that route. So now what you can do is have uh, a new key created uh, with, uh, with a uh, multi-region capability 
and have that in your backup region and presumably uh, uh, decrypt then that uh, vault in the other side. Now, uh, apparently you cannot do this with an existing KMS key and you have to create a new one uh, in order to enable it. Uh, all right, let's see other announcements. Um, yeah, this was uh, brought up to my attention. Um, uh, Amazon has officially started coming out with their own Terraform modules. Um, so that's exciting to see them investing in Terraform. Now, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, you know, see some attribution here for the label module, but uh, anyways, there, it looks like they've taken some inspiration for Cloud Posse and how we've done our modules conventions here. Um, and then looking through some of these, I think uh, I think they they've got a ways to go in order for these to start looking <laughs> looking like the kinds of modules we'd all like to go and use. So I, I don't get this. I guess they have yeah. an example in the root instead, and they are using sub modules. Maybe yeah, that's what they're doing. So interesting convention, but not mine. Yeah, I, I would say. I've looked at tons and tons of Terraform modules over the years and different uh, uh, groupings of them from various organizations, I'll say. And I, I, the thing that I've noticed is that the vast majority of them are get up and running so you can learn the product quickly. They're not production ready uh, yeah. modules out there. And Amazon's official ones seem to still fit in that category. Like if you want to spin up some of their technology really quick to, to play around with it and learn it and do all those kind of things, they look like they'd be pretty good for that. But if you actually want to run any of the stuff in production and feel confident about it, they're not there yet. Maybe yeah. they are, and, and maybe they'll never be there yet. I don't know, but we'll see yeah, you know, at some point. Yeah, and I don't know, maybe that was never the purpose for this organization. Maybe this is the purpose of this organization is to provide simple module examples to get started with the full intention that you're just gonna copy these in and modify them uh, and not create like highly reusable modules. The other fact is that they don't have right like any uh, you know testing in place. Um, so yeah, which means that these are gonna just... break. Go ahead, man. No, no, I was just going to say without testing, that means that uh, they, they are eventually going to break. It's just a matter of when versus like not if. Yeah, so, so, so true. Was that Vlad I heard uh, coming through the wire? Yeah, I'm very confused because they are, the modules are part of two organizations uh, in GitHub, AWS IA and AWS Quick Start. The modules seem to be of a very dubious quality to put it mildly <laughs> i don't I understand the purpose I, in any way shape or form like does I don't anybody have any background on this no i i don't get it i mean when i looked at them uh and just randomly i mean it feels like they were done with by the summer intern um so according to their website it's a collaboration between aws and hashicorp hmm. so this is even more confusing and i'm trying not to swear <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, so uh, good question that we should bring up for Taylor. Uh, Andy, add that to the list. What's going on with uh, AWS IA? So, so Amazon is going to buy Chico. Uh, that's what's happening. <laughs> Gear, <laughs> gearing up for that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, I'm yeah, so just a, sorry, go on. I was just going to say, I'm surprised to see. Um, you know, when you when you mentioned it, I think uh, earlier in the week, I looked at it, looked at it, and I'm surprised to see who they got involved because it's like Anton, who is already running very successful modules, um, yeah. and he's a Hashcorp ambassador. He's a AWS hero. Yeah. Um, why would they not, you know, just like reach out to him and like, you know, bring those under the umbrella? I actually wouldn't yeah. want that to happen, but like, I'm surprised that isn't what they did. Instead they're right. you know, yeah. write, writing like right. modules with training wheels on them as their like first pass and publishing that, which just seems like it's not a, not a foolproof, foolproof uh, way to do things. 
And also just a public service announcement. A lot of people don't even realize that these are not official AWS modules. This is just yeah. a arbitrary <laughs> GitHub organization with, with some very influential Terraformers in there. But it's not official by HashiCorp. It's not official by AWS. It's not backed by a company. Uh, this is just a popular organization with uh, GitHub module. It's the logo that gives it away. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll I'll add that um, without getting into too many details, uh, I've had a bunch of conversations with AWS about Terraform modules and Terraforming, having official Terraform modules built for them, and all those kind of things. And they um, they're a company that just could not get out of their own way in deciding on the best way to to go about doing that. In at least in the past, maybe they've yeah. They've done that. So they've made several bizarre um, choices along the way. So it doesn't surprise me, Matt, that, that they didn't do what, you're, what you suggested. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I wonder if uh, it's almost deliberate. Uh, you know, don't uh, let, let's not put a very functional version of this out there because it will compete with CloudFormation or something. Or will compete I don't with know. I mean, I don't think it's that sinister. No, I don't think it's that. I mean, I Werner, Werner Vogels is like in keynote, like addresses, yeah. spinning stuff up with Terraform. So it's clear yeah. like they're not against it, <laughs> at least yeah. at that level. Oh, it's a massive driver of money yeah. for them. They don't, they don't care how you build the resources as long as you like spin up the resources and yeah. they get paid for them. Yes. No harm it's there. It's good to see it. It's good to see it pick up steam because it just means yeah. they'll write their APIs better to be yeah. always yeah. like, you know, in that crud fashion that, that Terraform is good at. So like that's, yeah. regardless of the way that happens, I think that as long as we have the APIs written to be useful for systems like Terraform, then we're in a good spot. And it, I feel like that's slowly building where, you know, there won't be things like, you know, you're not able to, uh, delete the default VPC easily or something like that. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm yeah. um, off on a tangent, but, but I, I feel like it should like be like a feature flag good. when you create an account, uh, like disable, de you know, default scaffolding or default uh, resources. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Then um, I was just skimming some of the announcements in the uh, Cloud Posse uh, Terraform Slack channel. And this one uh, stood out. So uh, Terraform 1.1 Alpha is out. So as a 1.1 release, they're going to be adding some uh, new functionality. I thought this was interesting um, uh, that they're coming out with this now. So it's a generator. Uh, so it will generate uh, the boilerplate for some kind of uh, resource. And it can even, I guess, um, uh, import state uh, as part of that uh, when it creates it. So I haven't looked more at it, but uh, kind of cool pattern. Yeah, I think this is to address that we have an existing an existing AWS account and we want to roll yeah. in and bring that all under management. They can basically use a combination of those two things to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah now, now if I can just say Terraform add account and it just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, like uh, Terraformer. Yeah. yeah, that would be... That would be scary because that would be impossible to read that code. <laughs> yeah, it would be. <laughs> and I bet there would be whole consultancies built around this. They're just going to have a farm of people clicking ops and account, uh, exporting it to Terraform, and then handing that over. See, we Terraformed it. Yeah. Yeah. So with this option, Terraform. you would be able to uh, to write code for Terraform just uh, without really seeing the the documentation you would just say throw from add and then I don't know AWS FP bucket and then uh, you would have yep. your yep. template. Wow, that's pretty cool. I think it will save up so much time skimming through uh, the documentation. That's gonna be be fun. Yeah. Um, I, I, if, if for no other reason that it really is great uh, as a learning uh, tool or mechanism for instruction, like you can just tell uh, students to run some command and it uh, yeah. spits out the resource for you. Yeah, it's 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 mildly useful, I guess, for resources. It would be very useful if it supported modules. But yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they don't yeah. do that now. So, so yeah. yeah it, 
So what I want is this, and this actually came up uh, unbeknownst uh, of this uh, announcement here, but what I want, and we're probably gonna add it to Atmos, is something that will let us just point to any module and it'll generate a root module for it. So what is a root module from any module? It's the variables and it's the outputs mm -hmm. and it's a, a state backend. Mm -hmm. So that's a very convenient pattern that would be easily um, uh, automated with a generator. All right, let's see, next announcement. Um, all right, and this is my last announcement. So if you guys have any announcements, oh. Uh, I, please I DM'd you one uh, as okay. well in Slack. Okay, I'll check that in a second. So this one, uh, I just mm -hmm. came across my feed as I was reading lunch and didn't get a chance to format it. But I think it's kind of cool. It's, it's not revolutionary, and I don't think they're original by any means, but uh, the idea is now any channel can be a huddle. And what's the difference between a huddle and starting a meeting? Well, it's always on, and you can see who's there, and there's actually a transcript of what's being said. Uh, video is not enabled, uh, either, uh, you know, deliberately, well, it's deliberate, but, you know, because they didn't get to it or because their, their, their explanation is, look, you know, that, that takes away actually from the purpose of a huddle. You, you got to be concerned about your background, your presentation, that you're paying attention. And the idea with a huddle is that you're just, you're just there and you, you jump in when you want to, and you don't, when you don't. Um, I can see per the usefulness of things like for standups or events that come up or any other kind of routine uh, purposes you have channels for um, as it yeah. being a nice thing. I, in a previous life, I, uh, I had some experience with trying to find something to do this and we used a tool called Sokoku, I think it's called. And uh, <laughs> And it was not uh, it was not particularly great. It's like no, I think it's S O. I think it's like S O C C. Yeah, <laughs> I think it. Yeah, I think it starts with an S O though, like so Koku, like or something like that. And then yeah. say collaboration or something. Maybe you'll find it. <laughs> no, Thanks. I don't know. I have to find it. I get, That's the problem with these clever yeah. names. Oh, there it, it is. is. So Koku. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Koku. And, uh, and that was basically, but you have, this has video and you can have mm. like your own, you have your own office that you show yourself like in and you can set your status. And then you have, you can have like breakout rooms for everything else and people can jump into it and uh, like second life for through. your office. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but uh, then they have like water coolers. So people could just like hop in and talk about stuff. If you saw someone was standing by the water cooler, like, um, yeah. but uh, it was, it didn't integrate with like all the other tools we were using, which made it like really hard. So like you had yeah. to use their own video. You couldn't just like start a Zoom call or, you know, you couldn't like pop into Slack from it or any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. It seems like uh, extroverts trying to enforce a, uh, a get in the office pattern on the rest of the, the tech world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You must come yeah. to the office and hang out in the chill zone. <laughs> yeah, I think honestly, it was from from our perspective, it was driven from some people who were more extroverted that were forced to work, you know, remotely um, because of the way our company was structured, but still wanted some interaction and to get to be able to chat with their colleagues, etc. Like every yeah. once in a while, in in informal ways, and and not have a hard barrier of like scheduling a meeting just when you wanted to tap someone on the shoulder and ask a question yeah kind of thing. so yeah so yeah and then uh the the thing i dm'd you eric uh like kind of blew my mind a little bit i only saw it at lunch but if this thing turns out to, to work then uh it's going to be a little crazy <laughs> Hold on me. Oh, it was this the GitHub code yeah, uh, generator. Co yeah, yeah that, co this is one of those pilots. things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that that's that's definitely uh, announcement worthy. And I guess it's called, this is Copilot is the name. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't Amazon also come out with some code generation um, yeah. platform? This seems like to be the next frontier of AI meets uh, development. I saw uh, some uh, nice take on Twitter that the. Uh, this is actually breaking GPL most likely. So um, I'll, I, I think some companies will actually ban it until at least they resolve the licensing issue. 
Yeah, no, and undoubtedly it's going to break all kinds of things like that. And I guess it's just surfacing how broken it is. Did but, anyone uh, try it, by the way? Uh, no, I have not. Yeah, the, the way that it, it works, if you read it, is, and this is probably the, the why it breaks it, is that, so GitHub said that they've, like, scanned, like, all the repositories that they have and ran AI bots on them to kind of, like, figure out, things that people are doing like in code all over the place. So when you when you actually try to write code um, that does something similar, it will make suggestions based on previous patterns that it's seen of people doing the same things. And they they show some pretty crazy examples of like, you know, map reduce functions and things that like you're like, how do they know that that's what I was trying to do? And it just, <laughs> and it just seems to work, which is kind of crazy. So I was like, whoa. But I I feel some kind of way about that because not everybody's code is great. I mean, I throw up some crappy ass code in the GitHub and if you're going to yeah. use that as a, as an example, maybe it's one of millions, but still. Well, well you I have, they're sussing this out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they run it statistically through like, and, yeah. well, and I'm sure they run it through some sort of like, you know, uh, um, like static analysis tools to make sure that it, it adheres to best practices and, you know, does a lot of those types of things, but um, it's, it, I played with it for like a couple of minutes and just use their, their examples. And it looks like pretty, it looks pretty cool. Like, I don't know, but I, I, I obviously don't have any real in-depth, you know, seat time with it, but I was, uh, I was kind of like blown away. It, it's a visual studio plugin right now. So mm. it's, it's just like, it's kind of like autocomplete, but it just does it for you. Um, and you can toggle through suggestions of what it suggested for you. Sometimes it comes up with multiple things and um, you can basically just like command bracket, like left and right to scroll through multiple suggestions and then accept them just like you would with like uh, IntelliSense, like autocomplete kind of things. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty cool. At the moment, so, they say it's documented that they, they don't do any kind of analysis on the code and they won't even get oh, do they? file. Uh, yeah, it seems like we're approaching the singularity there. But, uh, yeah, this is <laughs> on the way to the singularity. This is based. I saw the stuff in GPT three, which was, you know, the earlier version, not tuned for code, and uh, it was pretty impressive. Uh, some of the stuff it came up with. Uh, so I'm I'm looking forward to this, especially as they say that the best use of this is for learning a new language or new uh, framework. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Like if you are familiar with JavaScript but need to learn React, this is going to yeah. be hugely helpful in helping you build React components, uh, or at least get familiar with how to build React components. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't support Terraform for anyone know. that's interested. <laughs> so you're stuck with Terraform Add for right now. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like the next thing we need to fork, Eric, and we got to create the Terraform version <laughs> of this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to that. I bet the uh, I bet a lot of people learning hash or Terraform want this now. So uh, over to the audience here. Let's see what we got in the office hours channel in terms of questions. Um, I didn't have a chance to update the slides with any uh, anything here. So uh, let's see here. Starting at the top um okay so uh andre uh he's a founder of a uh, leap leap makes a pretty cool thing we haven't had him on the the show yet but leap makes a pretty cool um uh, electron based app that you can use to assume uh roles and uh on your workstation it supports uh, federated logins uh, saml aws so hard-coded credentials works with your um native keychain and everything. Haven't yet had a chance to uh, try and integrate it into what we're doing at Cloud Posse yet, but definitely following the project. So let's see what what uh, Andre was saying. Um, they have a new version of the app uh, to support uh, AWS named profiles. Uh, re ah, requested by uh, yours truly, uh, Jeremy Godberg here. So Jeremy, they implemented something for you. You better go check it out now. Yeah, this uh, uh, conceivably could work um, to uh, solve all of our, if, if this works the way I hope it works, 
then this will solve all of our SAML login problems for all of our clients. Wow. Wow. All right, cool. Well, uh, maybe uh, uh, take some time out of your day uh, today or tomorrow and see, uh, evaluate that and give uh, Andrea some uh, yeah. feedback. We'll take a look. Cool. Uh, Jeff, uh, Lanza asks a good question here. Has anyone worked with declarative config for AWS Control Tower? The official Terraform, for, uh, Terraform provider for AWS has resources for various components, config, organization, security hub, but I don't, don't see anything from Control Tower itself. Well, that's true because there is no such capability uh, to manage Control Tower. And you'll see that the terminology of Control Tower and Landing Zone has been repurposed by a lot of like Terraform provider, or Terraform modules and marketing materials, but none of them implement the official AWS Control Tower uh, for that. Yeah, I just looked at it and it seems like even the enrollment process has um, dozens of cloud formation stacks that it's going to put out. And so um, yeah, we're thinking about using it, but just trying to figure out where the edge between that and the, yeah. the Terraform would be. So. Yeah, so I, I guess, you know, um, if they came out with first class API support for control tab, or I guess we would uh, start supporting it at Cloud Posse. We've been able to implement full support for organizations and terraforming of accounts and uh, you know, provisioning SCPs and all of that with uh, pure Terraform. Um, it's not end to end uh, in terms of there's usually uh, a gap in between provisioning the accounts and then provisioning stuff inside of the accounts. Um, but uh, I, I don't uh, consider that a fault so much as uh, just the, the decoupling of life cycles that the generation of organizations and accounts is decoupled from the resources they're in. Um, so yeah, so that's my take on it. Uh, Cloud Posse is pub, uh, upstreaming all of our uh, components uh, that we use for this. Um, Right now, it is um, for more power users of Terraform and who understand the Cloud Posse way of doing things. Uh, this stuff will be internally consistent with that. Um, and if you go to github.com slash Cloud Posse slash Terraform AWS components, you'll see our module here that we use to manage AWS accounts. Uh, this handles uh, organizational units, uh, service control policies, um, uh, all that jazz. Uh, and then uh, relating uh, related modules to that. Thanks. All right, let's see other questions in the channel here. Uh, any other follow-ups or anything else somebody wants to add to this control tower uh, question? All right. So Charles uh, Sperbeck asks, uh, Mute Cloud Posse, we're looking to utilize your open source modules and provide a simplified format for developers to use uh, Terraform. Um, now, this is CDK. So are we talking about the, uh, the Amazon version uh, or the Amazon uh, code generator for Terraform, Terraform CDK with TypeScript? Didn't know if there was uh, any thoughts or advice using your modules with CDK. Yeah, you know, I haven't, uh, we've never really, seriously looked into using CDK with Terraform. Um, I find we've, uh, we've had recently had a conversations on office hours a little bit about this. And my opinion with the code generation here is that yes, you're making your developers happier uh, by writing in a language they're already familiar with, in this case, TypeScript, but are you really solving the problem you set out to do? Um, and you're not gonna find examples for TypeScript hence uh, kind of this question, the documentation is gonna be a, a lot more uh, sparse. Uh, debugging it, uh, now, now you got another layer, you got a, like a big reason for using something like TypeScript uh, or, or a, a formal language is so you can attach your debugger and attaching a debugger here isn't really gonna help you do anything but debug the code generation and debugging the code generation is probably not what you set out to do anyways. So uh, this is one of these purist arguments like, uh, I, I, we're a Java shop, so we write Java, you know, or I, I, and I don't subscribe to that anymore. And I feel like uh, in, in a, in the modern landscape, you know, you, you inevitably rely on many, many languages 
uh, CSS and HTML and JavaScript and TypeScript and uh, frameworks therein within JavaScript. And then you, you, you have your Go utilities and you, you know, now your infrastructure is code. Uh, you know, you're an Amazon shop, so you don't do Terraform. Okay, so you're using CloudFormation. Then you're writing everything in some obtuse JSON format, or uh, I don't know. It's like, I think, um, I think it's better to optimize for what most people are doing because then when you try and search for answers you're going to get the greatest chance of most people being able to help you versus going down some esoteric path of, of picking something that sounds cool but isn't really well adopted cool uh, thanks so, for uh oh sorry i was just going to add one quick point to that is that um when you inevitably expand your team and uh, try to hire people, you also find people that have more experience with sort of whatever the mainstream thing is and not the fringe things like out there as well. So just another point. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, um, the, the use case there, so this is kind of like almost like an add on. Um, mm. So we, we had a, like an organizational journey of uh, centralized operations and that kind of got to be a bit much. And then it swung over toward a developer self-service with Atlantis, being able to apply your own Terraform um, yep. as long as it was approved and that went badly. And so I'm trying to strike a balance <laughs> in, the, in the middle of with like a right. module modules pattern. And then uh, like, you know, one of the, the que questions was like ease of use. And I mean, I'm, I'm really on the, the side of that you should learn, you know, HCL even in a minimized instance, um, like I said, talking about, you know, purity. And this doesn't really add a whole lot other than just like readability because uh, you're going to use HCL, you do it like a module, modules or you know, a root module on the superset, um, then you're going to end up supplying all your values so you can just give it a name. Uh, yeah. So you're going to create an instance in the way that the company approved way. Um, so that, that was kind of like the general, the, the base idea. This was like the, I guess you could say the, the SE on the top and I've been like going back and forth. So that, uh, thank you for the opinions on that. It uh, greatly helps. So this is something I'd like to say that I think we've solved at Cloud Posse now in a really elegant way. Um, we are open sourcing all of it, but only bits and pieces are public right now. Uh, if you do wanna get uh, a better look at it, uh, I do suggest you reach out to me directly and I can show you it, it addresses this uh, and builds on our module ecosystem. And the idea is really this thing that you provide the organization a catalog of modules uh, kind of your prescribed way of doing it. And then everything else is just pure configuration. It's just YAML snippets you drop in or import. Um, and uh, it, it provides this tremendous reuse of uh, your modules. And it works really well with uh, Terraform continuous delivery patterns, one of which that we're focused on right now is uh, Spacelift. Uh, so Spacelift is an al Atlantis alternative. And what you said with Atlantis, I know a lot of people work with Atlantis. I know a lot of large organizations work with Atlantis and somehow they make it work. But what you run into is uh, challenges in policy control or uh, giving teams that autonomy on how much damage they can do uh, or, how, or how much uh, you know, good, uh, good things they can help out with. So uh, that's my two cents. Anyone else? I still feel like if you want to use TypeScript, you should go Polymer way and then not mm. the CDK way because at least they have good doc. <laughs> that could be. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, although native C like CDK, not CDK for for Terraform, but CDK CDK is actually like pretty good too. They they marshal everything to yeah. I mean everything gets marshaled even Polumi at some point, but um, they marshal to excuse me, cloud formation and CDK, and that works pretty well. Mm -hmm. The thing I don't like about Bloomy just in general is that in order to really use it effectively, you have to trust your state to be stored at Bloomy, and that, that worries me a little bit. But, you know, uh, they, have some, they have some workarounds around it, but it's not easy to get set up, and it's not the default or any of that kind of thing. Interesting. Why, why is it that you have to store your state with them? That, that's like the native provider for for Polymi. it's just a default store. yeah yeah you can you can opt out of it um but it's 
it's not the easiest to set up to opt out of it. And you need to use their their SaaS platform to actually like run a lot of your CI CD and all that kind of stuff. It's not easy to do without opting into them, which I understand why. Oh, and that's how they're making money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. There was a very impla- impassioned uh, comment that we received months ago on our video here. We had this conversation before. You might want to check out uh, why use Terraform instead of CDK or Pulumi. I'll share a link to that, but someone lays out their argument for why Pulumi. Um, I could see where this was going. I didn't want to engage, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, to each their own. All right, uh, let's see, any other questions here that we got in the office hours today? We got another uh, 10 minutes or so. Mm. Michael Jenkins has a question. Yeah. Oh, Jenkins? Yeah, I dropped that right. at the bottom if, if there's time. Um, so I'm working with, uh, I guess, a couple different thoughts on how to manage customer managed keys with resources. So. Uh, and I guess the, the case is I'm creating a bunch of resources that need to be encrypted, right? So the one thought is you can create one key and, you know, use that to encrypt all your stuff as, you know, passing that key in as an input, or you can have the resource or the module specifically create its own key and use that for uh, encryption. I was just wondering if, if there's any best practices or just another school of thought on how to manage your customer managed keys. Matt, do you have any uh, thoughts on this one? I would say it depends on what you're encrypting and um, the level of um, uh, precision that you need to grant Mm -hmm. uh, people the ability to decrypt what you're encrypting. Um, So if you need, if it's a a line of segmentation where you have distinct groups that can read the two things that you're encrypting with the same key, then you want to probably use two different keys. Um, But if it's the same group or audience that you're encrypting something for, it's perfectly fine to reuse the same key for multiple purposes, um, you know, out there to do that. That would be kind of my, my way of looking at it, you know, and, you know, Clearly, you don't want to cross like, you know, production and non-production boundaries and, you know, that kind of thing with keys. But like uh, within any of those things, like if you have, you know, group A of people who can see some part of what you're encrypting and group B who can only see a different part of it, then you should definitely use two different keys. But if group A and B can both see everything that you're encrypting, then just use a single key. Yeah, that that's a, a good point. Um, we are at least making the distinction between, say, like production and non-production keys. Yeah. And typically within those environments, if you have access to that environment, you can pretty much see everything. So we could have one key that says, OK, this is the non-product key. Go for it. Um, and that would make management of the keys a little bit easier. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. But then if you want to segment, you're going to have to re-encrypt everything. If you want to, like yeah, if we'll all see. your resources are using the same keys, like it doesn't seem like a good idea to me, but. Well, that's exactly what we're doing right now because we've been using the um, the default keys. And I mean, following security best practices, now we have to own our keys and rotate them accordingly. So all of our resources that are encrypted using the default keys, we're basically recreating them so before we go down that road we want to figure out the best way to manage all these keys that we're going to have to create yeah cool well uh thane uh, i see you're also on office hours today earlier this week you asked uh, or last week you asked a question uh related to packer i think we have a couple uh packer uh experts on the on the call today so let me read this uh, out um I think it would make a good topic to discuss via office hours. Um, I've been, um, Thane has been using uh, Packer for a year now at an old company and it worked flawlessly. However, at a new company with restrictions on AWS security groups and any security group created with wide open access is automatically deleted. 
Therefore, when uh, trying to use packers to do anything via SSH, uh, it times out waiting for SSH access. Does anyone know of a good way to specify something other than uh, 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 in the packer file? And I see a couple of answers came out. One was from uh, Michael Jenkins, who just asked the, the previous question. Uh, Michael says uh, he's run into the same scenario. Basically, the workaround is to create a security group that is compliant and then use your packer run. So I guess you just got to work with, therefore, the SecOps team to decide what is a compliant rule uh, that you'd be able to add there. Yeah. Zane, were you um, able to yeah. get around your issue? Yes, I sure was. I was able to add a packer command uh, in the build section that okay. or i'm sorry in the source section that just said uh temporary security group source ciders and then i went in and created like the 10.000 and that got around the whole issue and it started working perfectly i just that uh temporary security group source ciders was buried in their documentation and i had scrubbed okay. it a couple times and just missed it but that is the key all right, awesome. That is uh, glad you worked around that. Yeah, I actually like that solution better than the one that I proposed because then you don't have to maintain this like detached sort of you know lonely security group that's only for Packer use. It's not associated with with anything. If, if Packer can create the security group that it needs with the correct ciders and then destroy it when it's done, that's much cleaner than having like I said this security group that's just sitting around doing nothing. Right. All right, uh, we got another few minutes here. Any more questions? I haven't, uh, let me, there's been a big chat going on here. I barely ever checked the Zoom chat here. So let's see what, uh, what's been brought up here. Oh, I didn't realize my uh, Eric had dropped, my, my Eric, my audio had dropped earlier. Sorry about that. It dropped a few times. Might oh, have, really? Might be losing some packets from your ISP or something. Ah, so annoying. Three second drop again, Vlad says. Huh. Bummer. Yeah, just all right. Uh, just while you're looking at that, I'll add that in the Packer thing, there's there's also a bunch of other things you can tweak in there, like um, like instance tendency is one. I know I worked with a company who would only could only launch things with like dedicated uh, tendency, like on their their instances and. Um, you can put in security groups, you can tweak timeouts and a whole bunch of other things if you dig into the, the Packer documentation. So it's, uh, it's definitely there. Thank you. I'll, I'll check it out. All right. Uh, any other announcements, maybe? Uh, cool products you've come across, Cly tools, announcements from AWS, features in Kubernetes, operators. Uh, I have an announcement. Uh, anyone that's using Nike's uh, Gimme Creds tool, uh, it broke for everyone today using Okta as well. Um, one of the best things to do, you know, just setting up a baseline new developer or, you know, pretty much anyone is always have them use Python environments. If you're ever going to do a pip install something, uh, try and stay away from your your system OS uh, because something changed on the Okta side today. Mm. Um, not, not the gimme creds and gimme creds uh, started breaking uh, across the board for anyone who uses it today. Um, and the fix was just to update to their, their latest one. But while updating to the fix, a bunch of people that work with me today uh, ran into a lot of errors with uh, Python because they had, originally installed it using, you know, just the system, yeah. not a, in an end. So I'll say, this is why I try as part of our solution that we deliver to customers categorically, not deliver any tools in the tool chain that are Python uh, or rails or Ruby or scripted, or I, I, I want single compiled binaries that are easily packaged version and distributed. So uh, for, the, for the purpose of gimme creds, what we've been using, and it works well with Okta, is SAML to uh, AWS, um, which is uh, in Go. However, 
you might want to check out this thing we brought up uh, at the start of the call. I, I can't make an endorsement because we haven't yet officially been able to uh, absorb it, but check out leap.cloud for a better UX uh, for getting your uh, AWS creds. All right, I will check that out too. Yeah. Is that Leap or, or Le App? Le App. You know what? <laughs> you, I, you might. <laughs> but they, they're, they're Italian, not French. So. Uh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not the right casing. Uh, app is feminine. Yes. <laughs> ah. La, la, <laughs> la, 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 la App. Yes, yeah. flat up. <laughs> ah, good to get uh, that corrected for the. You can tell I'm not a I'm not a very good French speaker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing on this subject, it, does anybody feel like AWS is just overly complex? In I mean, we have so many tools yes. to deal with this. <laughs> yes. Okay. Wait, was that up? Is anybody else doing it better? Like, is Azure or Google doing it much better? Uh, but don't you say the S, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what was that, Emil? The not Google, I would say. Okay. Not use Azure. The, the problem is like the IAM policies. Like it's really complex on AWS. Like it's probably the most complex system, but it's like also very good. Like compared yeah. to what Google offers, which is much simpler, but also much more annoying to work with. <laughs> so interesting. But the load uh, balancers of of Google is like years above like light years <laughs> better than what aws offers hmm. what about digital ocean they're doing it much better <laughs> <laughs> yeah when you're just shipping a single instance i think that's that makes it easy yeah, yeah oh, they I have just, kubernetes I, clusters man yeah, actually they do. Oh. that'd be a very that'd be a great uh basic uh reference architecture to yeah. build up uh, with digital ocean just showing how you can use it but it's not high availability on the control plane so they only have yeah. one machine. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I actually think I think uh, DigitalOcean is actually a tutorial company that happens to run a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm very laughs> <dead. laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> but you do have like more provider like Railway uh, and Render now that are coming up for smaller shops. Uh, mm on top of AWS. And I, I've seen also someone build an equivalent of Versal, but, uh, or Netlify for your AWS account that provisions everything for Only you and uses them. 75 resources. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it is pretty uh, beautiful what Versal has done with their uh, client and how easy it is to bring up a site. All Actually, right, well, now the cloud, I, I receive a digital ocean. They now have a managed MongoDB. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. They, they have a bunch of things. Uh, yeah. They got the managed uh, MySQL and the Mongo then. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, it's a great playground, especially for getting started with infrastructure as code. Um, I mean, for anybody, uh, like if somebody was saying like, how do we uh, do the, you know, come up with an inexpensive tutorial for AWS that's meaningful? I mean, I, I would say, well, is the objective to learn AWS or is the objective to learn Terraform? Because to learn Terraform and AWS at the same time, whew, that's, that's a much bigger uh, challenge. If you, but the digital ocean is like cakewalk by comparison. And then again, much simpler and, and primitive in what you can do. But for learning, excellent. Um, all right. Uh, that is the end of our hour today. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Great conversations, exciting announcements. Uh, if you want to share this with your team, uh, head over to youtube.com slash C slash cloud posse. Again, youtube.com slash C slash cloud posse. And there you'll be able to find this recording and all of our past office hours recordings, as well as interesting outtakes where we explain uh, specific subjects that came up during our calls. We also have a bunch of uh, follow-up action items for you. Uh, if you haven't yet joined our Slack team, head over to slack.cloudposse.com. Again, that's slack.cloudposse.com. Or uh, you know, subscribe to our podcast to get these uh, delivered straight to your phone. So go to podcast.cloudposse.com. Thanks, everyone, for your time today. Love your participation. Talk to you all.
next week, same time, same place.